still waiting or are you starting? Hi everyone! Can you hear me? No. Yeah. Can't. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I tried. Try again. Oh, try again. Oh, and even Martin. And even Martin is here. <laughs> Just kidding. I could. I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. Okay. Hi everyone. Oh, too many microphones there. Hi everyone. Chris. Key Institute colleagues, students, friends, and visitors. It is a great pleasure to introduce our distinguished ski seminar speaker, Jim Farrell. Jim is the chair of the Department of Chemical and Systems Biology and also a professor of biochemistry at Stanford University. And in this capacity, I just learned this morning, he was on the PhD thesis committee of our very own Brad Cairns, the co-director of the Hansman Cancer Institute up the hill. Jim got his PhD in chemistry as well as an MD at Stanford. And before that, at Williams College, he triple majored in, and this is his chosen order, physics, mathematics, and chemistry. So here's a note to our students. Make sure you get your fundamentals in order. <laughs> With such a diverse background, Jim is clearly a Renaissance man, and that's many years after the official historical period, obviously. And as will become evident, <laughs> When I finally give him a chance to talk, Jim is also a pioneer of systems biology. And that, I dare say, is many years before the term was even coined. So his work on cellular switches draws parallels between biological systems and more traditional engineering systems, optical, electrical, or even mechanical systems. And some of the tools he's using to study cellular switches are familiar to engineers. For example, solving differential equations in the software, and software environment of Mathematica. And surely there's a note to our students here too. Da, da, da. So <laughs> this is Jim's first visit to Utah. Please do help me welcome him to the Ski Institute. Thanks, Orly. That was great. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for, for coming, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about some biology today, um, where um, some computations and some theory has helped us to get deeper insight into the biology than we would have had otherwise. Um, and um, feel free to interrupt at any time. I'm, I'm happy to go off on tangents or to stop and make myself clear. I know there, there are people here with all sorts of different backgrounds. And if I, if I say something incomprehensible, um, stop me and, and force me to make myself understood. Okay. There will be three parts to this. Um, one story, it's, it's really one story, but a story in three parts. Um, first, I'll show you that the response of this protein, this regulatory protein, CDK1, cyclin-dependent protein kinase 1, which is a regulatory protein that drives the cell cycle. I'll tell you that the response of this thing to its input protein, cyclin B, is hysteretic with bistability. And then I'll show that this biostability gives rise to trigger waves, which are waves of propagating activity states that are analogous to the propagation of an action potential down the axon of a nerve or the propagation of a forest fire through a forest, um, the sort of self-perpetuating activity state. Um, and we'll make the argument that, that these trigger waves help to spatially coordinate the process of mitosis in cells that are, that are huge, like frog cells, where it's not trivial to get information around the entire cell rapidly. And then finally, I'll, I'll tell you about how after a frog egg has divided and has become a multicellular embryo, um, the cell cycle is run in each of those daughter cells, 
And I'll, I'll provide some evidence that, that their cell cycle oscillators are coupled with each other. So the, the overall rhythm of the embryo is a collective decision that's made by all these cells. All right, so I thought I ought to show you the, um, this cell cycle business. Um, this is a, a video I got from, um, from, from Jim Smith of a frog egg that's been fertilized and is going through its first 12 embryonic cell cycles. And this is sped up. So what you're seeing in a second is actually taking about a half hour in real time. But, um, but even at that, a half hour to do a whole cell division cycle is really fast. That's much faster than bacteria um, divide. It's much faster than most other eukaryotic cells divide. So these are very um, rapid oscillations, and that's kind of one obvious property. Another obvious thing is how regular these cell divisions are. Um, you can just sort of, um, you, can, you can beat along with the embryo here. Um, it's about a pulse a second here in this movie. You can see there's, um, let's see, let it go over. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom. So it's a, it's a precise period. Um, so, it, so it really looks more like an oscillator than most biological oscillations do in that regard. And these are autonomous oscillations. And by that, I mean, if you think of the cell division cycle as a, as a sequence of events, like you need to replicate DNA, and then you need to do mitosis, and then you need to divide the cell in two. Um, you can block any of those events, and still there's a once every half an hour pulse of CDK1 activation and inactivation. So these really seem like autonomous biochemical oscillations that drive this important biological process. Um, so the questions that we're going to pose here are, how are these os oscillations generated? And then um, how, how is spatial coordination um, ensured? You've, you've all probably seen frog eggs in a pond at some point. These are, these are cells that are, that are big. These are macroscopic cells. Um, a xenopus egg is more than a millimeter in diameter. And so how do you make it so that mitosis happens everywhere in that millimeter of cytoplasm at the same time? All right, so we know from work over the last 30 years um, that all eukaryotic cell cycles are driven by the periodic synthesis and degradation of of proteins called cyclin proteins. Um, and the synthesis and degradation of cyclin proteins drives the activation and inactivation of this protein kinase that I mentioned, CDK1. When CDK1 is active, a cell will go into M phase, mitosis. And when it's inactivated, that then allows the cell to go from metaphase to anaphase and exit mitosis. And this is just some, um, some quantitative data that comes from cycling frog egg extracts. And I think you can see from this that um, cyclin levels rise more or less linearly, and then they plummet down um, abruptly. Um, CDK1 activation, on the other hand, rises very gradually and then explodes up and then comes back down. So you've got sawtooth, uh, sawtooth oscillations in cyclin abundance driving explosive activation and inactivation of CDK1. We know a lot about the components that are necessary for these cell cycle oscillations, and we also know how they're wired together in circuits. And um, in every eukaryote where um, um, the cell cycle has been studied so far, um, you, you've got all of these components, and they're always wired together in this exact fashion. Um, so cyclin gets synthesized, gets translated at a more or less constant rate, binds with high affinity to the cyclin-dependent protein kinase subunit. And if this is in the right phosphorylation state, then um, it'll be active as a protein kinase. And when it's active as a protein kinase, it can phosphorylate hundreds of target proteins. And it's the collective consequences of the phosphorylations of all of these target proteins that bring about the dramatic process of mitosis. Okay. Now, um, when um, one of the things that's phosphorylated by an active cyclin CDK complex is this thing, um, the anaphase promoting complex in its CDC20 bound form. And when this has been phosphorylated sufficiently by CDK1, 
um, it becomes active as a ubiquitin E3 ligase. And that ubiquitin E3 ligase ta tags cyclin proteins, either cyclin proteins that are bound to CDK1 or free cyclin proteins with polyubiquitin chains. And that makes those cyclin proteins get degraded by the proteasome. So in total, this is a negative feedback loop. This thing activates this, and this is an inactivator of that. Okay, so the circuit contains a negative feedback loop, and we figured it must. There's actually a conjecture that goes back to Rene Thomas that says that any biochemical or biological oscillator must have a negative feedback loop built into it. And although that conjecture has never been proven mathematically, there, there are no examples yet. There are no counterexamples to the, to the conjecture. So, so here's our negative feedback loop. And we know from experiments that it is, in fact, essential for getting oscillations out of this circuit. Um, so if you take a version of cyclin that can't be polyubiquitolated by the APC, that version of cyclin will drive a frog egg or a frog egg extract into mitosis normally, but then the egg or the extract will get arrested in mitosis. It'll never reset the cell cycle back to a low CDK1 activity state and be back in interphase. So this is an absolutely essential part of the circuit, really interesting part of the circuit. A postdoc in the lab, Chong Yong, has um, done the first quantitative dissection of this part of the circuit, and it turns out it's a time-delayed, ultra-sensitive switch. It's sort of a st the activation of this thing is a step function that happens about 10 minutes after this thing becomes activated. And those are very um, useful properties for building a biological oscillator. But there's not just this negative feedback loop. There's also this other stuff here. There's a positive feedback loop and a double negative feedback loop. And double negative is the same logically as, as positive. And again, they're always present in all um, CDK1 oscillations. And um, the way it works is um, a little bit of active CDK1 brings about the multi-site phosphorylation of CDC25. And once it's gotten enough phosphorylations put on it, it's active as a protein phosphatase. When it's active, it can dephosphorylate an inhibitory phosphorylation on CDK1. So a little bit of active this promotes the activation of this. When that's active, it promotes the activation of inactive this. And then the double negative feedback loop, CDK1 can phosphorylate, again, at many sites, um, this protein kinase We1. And when We1 is fully phosphorylated, um, it becomes inactive. Um, but when it's dephosphorylated, when it's active, it can phosphorylate CDK1 at that same site that CDC25 removes and can inactivate it. So here's inactivation of an inactivator, activation of an activator, mirror image, positive and double negative feedback loops. Now loops like these in principle can do all sorts of interesting things for, for um, cellular signal processing. Um, a positive feedback loop can act as a magnitude amplifier. So taking a small number of active signaling molecules and converting them into a large number of active output molecules. Or a positive feedback loop can act as a sensitivity amplifier. Um, it, it, can, it can add gain to a circuit. It can make a small change in an input translate into a large change in output for a circuit. Um, but probably the most famous thing that these positive feedback loops can do, and it's not a guaranteed property, but something they have the potential to do, is to generate bistability and hysteresis in a response. So here, let's imagine that cyclin is the input to the system. And um, if, if cyclin was just binding to and directly activating CDK1, what you would expect would be an input-output relationship that would be like this dotted black line up here. Just add more cyclin, you um, activate more and more CDK1 until you've activated it all. Um, so you could, the, the kind of vanilla response would be one of these hyperbolic, familiar, um, gradual graded stimulus response relationships. But if you've got positive feedback loops and the parameters are all proper, 
um, you can end up with a situation where as you dial up the input to the system, you get a tiny bit of CDK1 activation until you get to a tipping point. And then at that tipping point, um, a little bit of active CDK1 activates more and more of the CDC25, inactivates more and more of the V1, which feeds back and feeds back and makes the system um, um, explode up to a higher CDK, steady state CDK1 activity state. Um, or if you did the opposite experiment, started with CDK1 active and dialed down the input stimulus, you would expect that the whole system would eventually fall down to a low activity, but at a different threshold level. So this is a saddle node bifurcation. That's a saddle node bifurcation. In between those two saddle node bifurcations, the system is bistable. So if you come from the left, you have access to this stable steady state down here. If you've come from the right, you have access to this stable CDK1 activity state up here. All right, so in principle, we could have bistability. And bistability is very useful if what you want to have is a biological switch between discrete states. And that's exactly what we have when you've got my mitotic entry. So the question is, um, does the CDK1 system actually function like a bistable switch? And you can investigate this question experimentally because you can start with not a frog egg, but a frog egg extract that's in either interphase or in M phase and dial up or dial down the, the cyclone concentration and see whether there are two possible stable steady states at intermediate cyclone concentrations or just one. All right, so that's based on this miracle. If you take um, frog eggs and pack them in a centrifuge tube so that there is very little extracellular buffer, and then just spin the centrifuge tube a little bit harder to shear the eggs, uh, you can obtain an undiluted frog cytoplasmic extract, kind of, kind of, Mocha flavored, I think. It's, a, um, uh, um, it, it's, it's got lots of membranes. It's a, it's a very heterogeneous, very complex mixture of things. Um, but um, if you just take that out of the tube then, um, it will do this and warm it up to room temperature. It'll do the cell cycle in vitro. It'll go through periodic activation of CDK1 and inactivation of CDK1. If you put sperm chromatin into one of these extracts um, as a reporter of the cell cycle phase of the extract, that sperm chromatin will recruit membrane components from the extract, form a functional nucleus, do DNA replication, and go into mitosis, and come out of mitosis and do DNA replication again, and on and on and on. So I think this is one of the evidences that, that God wants people to do biology research. Um, that there are experimental systems as, as, um, as incredibly powerful as this. And the, for, for our purposes here, what this allows us to do is to start in interphase, add cyclin, get the stimulus response relationship, start in M phase, take cyclin away, and get the stimulus response relationship and see if they're the same or different. And it turns out the results are like this. If you start in interphase, you get a little bit of activity, a little bit of activity, a little bit of activity, and then you bump up to a higher amount of activity. If you start in M phase and dial down the cyclin concentration, the CDK1 activity goes down, 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 and then eventually falls down to very low levels, but at a different threshold level. So here the system is monostable with only low levels of CDK1 activity. Here the system is monostable with only high levels of activity. And here the system is bistable with two possible stable levels of CDK1 activity. And, um, up here, um, uh, the, the important thing is that, that um, all of these levels of CDK1 activity are high enough to put an extract into a good M phase. And none of these levels of CDK activity are high enough to put one into to M phase. So, so the system skips over the levels of intermediary CDK1 activation. So that, that helps explain why the transition between interphase and M phase is really discrete. I think you can see this best from the sort of cell biology experiment. These are sperm nuclei that have been put into an extract. There is three sperm nuclei and they're stained with a DNA dye. 
and you can see nice bland looking DNA, nice smooth looking nuclear envelopes there. So this is interphase, 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 and then finally mitosis up here. Okay, mitosis, my, starting with M phase, you're in mitosis, 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 stay in mitosis basically indefinitely until you get down to a lower level of CDK1 activity, and then you're finally able to fall back down into, into interphase. So it's not just the biochemical activity of CDK1, but the, the whole cell biology of the extract is, is hysteretic. All right, so that's part one. CDK1 activity is regulated by these positive and double negative feedback loops, and that produces a circuit that acts like a bistable toggle switch. And um, that helps make interphase and emphase qualitatively distinct states, and it also is, uh, is important in a lot of other ways. And, and we've been studying this bistable trigger for, for years and years and years. It really started with this paper from Joe Pomerenning in my lab showing that there was hysteresis, but then looking at the functional importance for cell cycle oscillations and looking for ultrasensitivity and the regulation of the double negative feedback loop and ultrasensitivity and the regulation of the positive feedback loop and requirements for positive feedback loops for making oscillations. It's, we've worked on this a lot and it's been, it's been really great fun and it's mostly published and you can read that if you'd like. Um, but what I'd like to talk about for the rest of the talk is unpublished stuff. And it comes out of this basic observation, basic discovery that there's this bistable trigger for mitotic entry. And um, the first of these unpublished stories is um, that it's got implications for the coordination of mitosis in this huge frog egg. So um, here's a huge frog egg that's been fertilized and it's going through mitosis. Let me play that once again. And I, I just want you to get the sense of the fact that mitosis is really happening in the whole egg pretty much at the same time. I, um, see, see, there's sort of blurp, blurp, boom, mitosis. Okay. So um, it's a, it's, it's a well-coordinated event. And this is a cell that's more than a millimeter in diameter. So what's the problem there? Well, if you have a normal cell, a, a, with normal dimensions, like a, a, a spherical cell in culture, eukaryotic cell in culture would have a diameter maybe of 20 microns, a radius of maybe 10 microns. And we know from studies of somatic cells that CDK1, this mitotic initiator, gets activated first in the, at the centrosome, which is, sort of, which is very close to the middle of the cell. So if you want to have mitosis happen everywhere in the cell at the same time, as long as you abruptly activate it at the centrosome, um, it's easy um, because all you need to do would be have CDK1 random walk its way through the cell. Um, and from the relationship that the distance that you random walk over is the square root of six times the diffusion coefficient times the amount of time you've let the random walk go for. Um, uh, if the distance you're talking about is 10 microns to get from the center to the cortex, and diffusion coefficients for proteins that are untethered proteins just sitting in the cytosol are typically about 10 microns squared per second. See that if you want to go 10 microns, you need this to be the square root of 100. So 6 times 10 times 2 will make it be more than 100. So um, in 2 seconds, a protein can make it anywhere in a cell, basically, a typical eukaryotic cell. But a frog egg is this huge thing. Its um, centrosome is somewhere down there, not quite in the middle of the cell, but uh, toward the north pole of the cell. It's 60 times the radius of a typical eukaryotic cell. So to random walk from the center of the cell to the cortex will take 60 squared times as long, 3,600 times as long. And as you all know, um, 3,600 is the conversion factor for seconds to hours. So instead of taking a couple of seconds to make it out to the cortex, it takes a couple of hours um, for a protein to make it from the center of a frog egg to the, the cortex of a frog egg. So you might imagine that the process of mitosis in a frog egg would be torpid, and it's not, it's fast. <laughs> 
Um, the first sign of mitosis in a frog egg is nuclear envelope breakdown, and it happens here. And within 10 minutes of it, you get the first sign of mitosis of the cortex of the frog egg, which is a thing that I'll show you later called a surface contraction wave. So somehow information has to get from here to here in 10 minutes. And you can't do that by diffusion. Um, now, there are a lot of ways that you could get information, but um, one particular possibility is suggested by the fact that there is this bistable trigger that brings about the activation of CDK1. Because if you have cytoplasm that's a big, continuous, bistable medium, like an excitable medium, um, information, activity states, can propagate through that medium faster and farther than the proteins themselves are making it. And, um, and in principle, they can go fast enough to account for that 10 minutes between the, the initiation of mitosis at the center of a frog egg and the initiation of mitosis at the, at the cortex of a frog egg. And let me go through to explain why this is. Um, I, probably some of you know about trigger waves. From, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the question is, what's that wave? See, the bloop, bloop, two waves, really, and then division there. Um, we'll talk about that a lot later. Those are surface contraction waves. They're not calcium waves. They're caused by a reorganization of the cytoskeleton at the, in the, the cortex of the cell. And, and those are the things that I'm referring to that are the first visible manifestations of of a mitotic-like event at the cortex of a cell. So those are the things that are happening 10 minutes after nuclear envelope breakdown happens in the, in the center of the cell. Okay? All right. So let's do a thought experiment here. Frog egg's pretty simple. It's a sphere, but let's make it simpler. Let's make the frog egg be a one-dimensional system, um, a long, infinitely long tube of cytoplasm. And um, let's imagine that the stimulus response relationship for CDK1 activity as a function of the cyclin concentration is what we saw it to be by experiments. It's, a, it's an S-shaped curve with bistability in between. This is actually a modeled curve, but it's modeled in a way that, that, that reproduces pretty much what the experimental results are. And now let's imagine that we're somewhere in this bistable region, say somewhere in the right-hand side of the bistable region. And let's imagine that in most of our one-dimensional tube of cytoplasm, the cytoplasm is in interphase. Okay, so it's in this low CDK1 activity state. And then finally, let's imagine that for some reason, there's an inhomogeneity in the cytoplasm, so that, that some part of the cytoplasm has actually made it into mitosis. So instead of having this low level of CDK1 activity, it's got this higher level of CDK1 activity. And then let's just think about what will happen in this tube um, when this mitotic cytoplasm interacts with this interface cytoplasm. Okay. Within the first micron or so of this interface, diffusion is really rapid. It's going to take place on a time scale of less than a second. So there will initially be, be very rapid mixing. And when you get that rapid mixing, what you'll do is take the system and put it halfway in between those two activity states in that little mixed region. But the system is bistable. There are two possible stable steady states, and that's not one of them. Um, that's got to either fall down to the low CDK1 activity state or fall up to the high CDK1 activity state. And the way I've drawn this, um, with this threshold or unstable steady state down there, this has no choice but to fall up to the high CDK1 activity state. So you have a rapid mixing followed by a conversion process that depends on the flipping time for the bistable system. And then once that's happened, you can again have a mixing, and then a conversion, and then a mixing, and then a conversion. And unlike diffusion, you know, diffusion, the, the driving force diffu for diffusion gets smaller and smaller the further you've diffused. But the driving force here 
never goes down because every time there's a mixing process, there's the conversion of new inactive CDK1 molecules to become active CDK1 molecules that can make the next mixing and conversion happen at exactly the same um, speed as the, as the previous one. All right, so, in pr uh, the, so what you could get would be M phase would take over the whole tube eventually. Um, then if you added negative feedback to this, uh, an APC that, that, that inactivated CDK1 after you were in M phase, then you could change this from just a wave of spreading M phase to a pulse of spreading M phase. And if you add cyclone synthesis, then you can get repeated pulses in principle. And you can estimate how fast this sort of propagation process should take place. There's a, um, there's a, um, there's a back of the envelope kind of formula that goes back more than 100 years to this guy Luther. Luther's formula says that the velocity of propagation here should um, go like the square root of the diffusion coefficient over the flipping time for the bistable system. And if we again choose a diffusion coefficient of 10 microns squared per second and guess that the flipping time might be something like 10 seconds or 100 seconds, then you end up with a velocity that's on the order of a micron a second. And a micron a second will get you 600 microns in 600 seconds or 10 minutes. So, so this is the... the this is a fast enough propagation um, mechanism to account for the spread of mitosis from the center of a frog egg to the cortex in 10 minutes, in principle. All right. Um, that's all sort of back of the envelope calculation stuff. If instead you start with, a, with um, an ordinary differential equation model of CDK1 activation and inactivation, that's been, that's been built with experimentally determined parameters that take into account all the nonlinearities in the positive feedback loop and all the nonlinearities in the double negative feedback loop, all the nonlinearities in the negative feedback loop, the time delays in the system. Um, if you start with that model and run it in a way that will reproduce the overall kind of activation, inactivation of CDK1 in solution, and just add diffusion terms to it to turn it into a partial differential equation model and make the assumption that CDK1 is going to get activated somewhere, like right in the middle, could be a centrosome, um, earlier than it gets activated in the rest of the tube. And what happens is CDK1 explodes in activity there and then propagates linearly up and down the tube from there. And you get out of mitosis, then you do the same thing again, and the waves become better and better organized as you, as you go on. So, and if you measure the propagation speed, just the slope of these fronts here, um, they end up being the same as what Luther's formula tells you they, they ought to be, about, about a micron a second, about 60 microns a minute. So it's plausible that a mechanism like this could be operating in the frog egg and could help coordinate mitosis. So, does it really work this way? Um, a, a graduate student in the lab, Jeremy Chang, set out to test this idea, this hypothesis that pre M phase cytoplasm is a bistable medium that allows the activity of CDK1 to propagate farther and faster than the actual CDK1 molecules do. And the way he tested it was by taking one of these cycling frog eggs, you can't, you can't actually look into a frog embryo because it's pretty opaque. But, but again, these extracts you can look through perfectly well. So he took a cycling frog egg extract, put it in a long, thin, shallow tube. So, so thin and shallow to minimize the possibility of flow in the tube, to make it so that the, the only way molecules are getting around is through diffusion. Um, and then he developed a microscopy assay for mitosis, which was basically to take this extract and randomly put <coughs> nuclei, sperm chromatin, into the extract um, in the presence of green fluorescent protein with a nuclear localization sequence on it. And the nuclei that are formed in an extract are good functional nuclei. They'll concentrate NLS-tagged um, GFP into them as long as they're intact nuclear envelopes. So in interphase, you've got green balloons in the extract, and then they pop when you go into mitosis. 
So it's a nice, easy readout for whether this nucleus in the extract is in mitosis or not. And then they stay in mitosis for a while, 15 minutes or so, and then they come back out into interphase and begin to concentrate the GFP inside them again. So that's the assay. And what Jeremy set out to do was to just to run this and then see what happened. And we imagine one of three things would happen. One possibility is when we make this extract, the cell cycles are starting everywhere in the extract probably more or less synchronously. So it seemed possible to us that the cell cycle clock is so precise in one of these extracts that basically every nucleus everywhere in the tube would go into mitosis at exactly the same time. Okay. Or it's possible that mitosis would go in, would happen in different nuclei at different times, but maybe it's because just every nucleus would be different. And so it's, it would have a, a different ability to um, to uh, bring about the activation of CDK1 or to respond to the act of CDK1. But maybe there'd be no correlation between one nucleus's entry into mitosis and, and any other nucleus's entry into mitosis. Or maybe we've got this trigger wave thing where mitosis would start at one place in the tube at some random nucleus, stochastically, and then its neighbors would go and its neighbors and so on and so forth. So. Here's one of these tubes. This tube was, I think, a little more than three millimeters long. It's a Teflon tube. It's 100 microns in diameter. It looks green because of the GFP NLS. There are a bunch of sperm heads in it, but the sperm heads haven't quite formed nuclei yet. So what we'll see is first the sperm heads turning into nuclei as little green balls, and then we'll see them go into mitosis. The, the little green balls will disappear. Nuclei, mitosis, nuclei, mitosis. What do you think? Is mitosis happening in waves? You want to see that again? I'd like to see this. <laughs> So I just um, centered the movie so that the, the waves would, would begin somewhere near the middle of it, but that's not any special point in the tube. All right, so mitosis does seem to propagate in, a, in some kind of a wave-like fashion in these, these extracts. Um, is it linear, or is it something more like diffusive spread, where the further you go, the slower you go? Um, you can tell that by just plotting um, the time of a mitotic event, either mitotic entry or mitotic exit, um, as a function of position in the tube. Um, and what you get is something like this. Here's the first mitotic entry, then the first mitotic exit. And it's hard to tell in the first um, mitosis whether they're little waves or, or no waves at all. But by the second mitotic entry, it's clear, like that one's going first, and then its neighbors are going, and then its neighbors, and, and then on and on. And it's clear that it's a, it's a linear spread of mitosis. If you look at the slope of this line to see how fast the mitotic state is propagating in the extract. It's going at 54 microns a minute. So, so just what the back of the envelope calculations and the modeling told us we might expect. And just what we need in order to get mitosis to spread from the center of a frog egg to the, the cortex of a frog egg in 10 minutes. As you go further and further and further, you can see the slopes are going down. That means the speed is going down. Um, and then eventually everything stops. But this is pretty amazing. This is, this is a cell-free system in vitro, and we've gotten one, two, three, four, five, six, seven mitotic entries to, to occur here. Now, um, if, you, if you were to say, well, all right, these look like straight lines, but you could probably fit a square root dependent, a parabola um, to, to those data too. 
um, and have it be a diffusion coefficient, how big a, a, a diffusive process, how big of a diffusion coefficient would you need to go um, this far, which is about a millimeter, in this long, which is about 18 minutes. And you need a diffusion coefficient of about 500 microns squared per second, which is out of the range of possibility for proteins. So, um, so this really looks like something that's happening too fast to be a diffusive process, too linearly to be a diffusive process, and right on the mark for, for one of these mitotic trigger waves. Now, if these are trigger waves, um, then in principle, if you cut the tube at some point, um, and have the two ends of the tube close to each other, but not in contact with each other, eventually those two ends of the tube should go out of phase with each other, okay? If they really require continual communication in order to stay in sync with each other. So in this experiment, the tube was under mineral oil. Jeremy cut the tube at this position, at this time, with a scalpel. And right away, it, it, you can see that you know, here, these nuclei are all going into mitosis at about the same time. Here, this nuclei, this nucleus is going into mitosis much earlier than that one. It's obeying the, the, prop, the linearly propagating wave that came out from there, whereas this one is obeying the wave that came out from there. So um, this is really consistent with a, with a trigger wave. Now, if the trigger waves are really due to this particular bistable system that we've been talking about, as opposed to anything else in the cell, which we haven't been talking about, then um, modulating the activities of the enzymes in this system should change the speed of the trigger waves. And there was one nice way to do that. It turns out there's a pharmacological inhibitor of WE1 and its close relative MIT1. In principle, if you make we one weaker, you should make it easier to flip this switch. And you should make it so that mitosis would still happen, but that the mitotic waves would propagate faster. So you sort of like this as a possible experiment. Partially break one of these enzymes and see if you can make the phenomenon occur faster. And so here's... Um, DMSO treated extracts and then extracts treated with three different concentrations of the inhibitor. This is enough inhibitor to inhibit CDK1 or to inhibit WE1 by about 20%. That's by about 50%. And that's by probably about 80 or 90%. And um, it's a little hard to compare because the slopes aren't constant in any treatment. The slopes are, are getting smaller and smaller with time. But, but if you take say this slope, that's shallower than that one is, which is shallower than that one is, which is shallower than this one is. So, so really there is a dose dependent increase in the rate of propagation, about a doubling in the rate of propagation as you um, decrease the activity of we one by about 80 or 90% in one of these extracts. All right. And then finally, um, do these waves actually happen in the fertilized eggs, um, could we get any evidence that would bear on this? And um, we, we thought we could, and we, we had an idea right from the start what these waves could be. And um, it's those surface contraction waves that, that, that we looked at in an earlier video. I'll show you that video again. Bloop, bloop, boom. Bloop, bloop, boom. So, so each of those bloops is a surface contraction wave. The first surface contraction wave depends on CDK1 activation. If you activate CDK1 prematurely, the surface contraction wave happens prematurely. The second surface contraction wave depends on CDK1 inactivation. So the thought is that this, the, the first one is sort of like a hallmark of mitotic entry hitting the cortex. And the second one is a hallmark of mitotic exit hitting the cortex of the cell. So a simple idea could be you've got one of these CDK1 activation waves starting somewhere in the cell. And my, our, our two bets as to where it might be starting would be either at this position, which is where the congressed pronuclei, pronuclei are in a fertilized frog egg right before mitosis happens, or maybe up here, which is where the female pronucleus starts with before the, firm, 
before the sperm has fertilized the egg. So maybe somewhere along this axis, um, a, a um, CDK1 activity wave could, could be initiated and then could spread not just linearly in one dimension, but could spread in an, a, in an approximately constant velocity spherical wave expanding from there. If that's the case, um, just with a little geometry calculations, you, you should be able to figure out at what time this constant expanding spherical wave makes it out to different points on the cortex. And um, you can derive a little formula for it. Um, if the wave starts out here, um, it should, the wave should spread along the cortex in this kind of V-shaped chymograph. Um, if it starts here, it should, it should spread out um, along the cortex in, in this U-shaped chymograph. And if it starts somewhere in between, it, it should be between this V-shape and this U-shape. And depending on how fast the, the spherical wave is expanding, um, that, that would change the, the time scale here. So the faster it goes, the more smooshed down that chymograph ought to be. So what we, and, and here's the, the, the terrible looking formula that describes the shapes of these curves. But you can derive this, you know, you could derive this with stuff that you knew in high school or with Mathematica these days. You don't even have to remember any of that stuff from high school. You can just derive this formula in about two minutes. Um, all right, so the experiment is to um, take this movie, draw a, a line across the egg, and then um, uh, measure the lightness and darkness of the egg at different, at different positions along that, along that line. So we'll have an experimental chymograph and see if that looks anything like this shape or this shape or something in between. And so here's what it looks like. Here's four of them from four different eggs. I don't know if you can see it, but here's the first surface contraction wave. And it spreads out in that sort of U-shape. Here's the second surface contraction wave. Again, it's sort of U-shape. And that's about the same. That's about the same. If you fit Jeremy's curve formula to these experimental data, it fit quite well. And you can back calculate out the, the parameters that, that give you these curves that tell you how deep it seems that the, the um, source of the, of the wave is and how fast the wave is propagating. And what you get is very nice looking. The, the speed's about, again, 60 microns a minute. So the same speed that we're seeing in tubes of extract. And the origin, the place where wave is emanating from is about halfway between this picture and this picture. About 85% of the way from the, the south pole of the fertilized egg to the north pole of the fertilized egg, which is kind of where we thought the, the, the wave was gonna, gonna come from. All right, so that's part two. I've shown you that mitotic signals travel through cytoplasm much faster than diffusion lets the proteins travel. Um, this can be accounted for by, my, by, by stability in the mitotic trigger. This whole mechanism, sometimes called trigger waves or detonation waves, is akin to action potentials in axons of, of neurons, akin to calcium waves going through cells and going through tissues, um, akin to cyclic AMP waves in dictyostelium. So it's a, this is a physical phenomenon that occurs in nature in different contexts. It's carried out by very different proteins, occurs on different time scales, but the basic principle is the same in every context. It's this positive feedback loop that enables a protein activity to spread through big distances rapidly. Um, and we think this, because this is independently evolved in so many different contexts, we, we think this could be a, an important general mechanism for mechanism for communication over large distances. I, um, I usually think of communication in organisms like us as occurring over a large distance scale, mostly by flow, your circulatory system, and so on. And over cellular distance scales, occurring mostly by diffusion. But 
you got this too. And this is an, uh, my bet is that over and over again, when cells have made use of positive feedback loops to regulate things in a decisive way, they will also exploit these positive feedback loops to allow for, for big spatial coordination. Yeah. So the question is, so the question is what travels, uh, what is traveling is the activity state of CDK1. CDK1 activation is spreading even though none of the CDK1 molecules that are a millimeter down the tube are the same ones as the ones that were initially activated. So it's the, it's, in, it's, it's really very similar to the spread of an action potential down an axon because you know, you've, got, you've got sodium ions that rush into the, the axon here and they bring about the opening of more channels down here and more channels down here, but it's not the same sodium ions that are making their way down it. It's the activity state of the sodium channel, the open state of the sodium channel that gets passed on through this positive feedback process. the phosphorylation state of the protein. It's a bistable regulatory system that flips from a CDK1 off state to a CDK1 on state, and that spreads further and further and further. And if you random walk backwards, you've still got new converts to carry the, the message on further. All right, I'll tell you one little tiny thing um, to, to finish up. Um, you can see there's good coordination even, even after you've done the division. You've got a multicellular embryo here and the cells continue to divide very synchronously. And in principle, this could be because all of their individual clocks are running precisely at the same speed. So every time you divide the, the embryo in two again, um, the, each daughter cell gets half of the clocks and they're running very precisely. But it's also possible that you've got some sort of communication that would make it so that an aberrant cell would be brought back into the fold by some communication from the rest of the cells. And I would think that that might be a more robust way to build this process of embryogenesis than just guaranteeing that every clock works perfectly. So um, Graham Anderson in the lab said about testing that idea, and the way he came up with to test it was to, to fertilize a frog egg and then put the fertilized frog egg in a temperature gradient. And I'll show you the, the, the gradient device that he did. So a warm side, cool side, cell cycle would go faster on the warm side and go slower on the cool side. So he could desynchronize the cells in this dividing embryo and then um, t take the gradient away, put the same temperature of water through both sides and see if the two sides of the embryo stay out of phase with each other forever and ever or see if they tend to come back into phase with each other. Here's this beautiful apparatus. This is high tech stuff that we do. I know, um, this is, oh, I won't tell you what that is. Um, but it, th these, are, these are, I think, these temperature blocks that people use to, to run their, um, their, their CPUs too fast so they can play games fast on computers. Um, so here's, um, as a position in the gradient with, with the same temperature now in both sides of the gradient, here's what a normal embryo would look like. Here's, he was able to score the division of three cells out of a four cell embryo here. And um, this division happens at almost exactly the same time. Here he's scoring four out of the eight cells. And again, almost the same time. You get flat lines. So, so very synchronous divisions all throughout the experiment. Now here, start out synchronous, apply the gradient, this side slows down, so the lines tilt downward, okay, tilt downward, downward a little further, take the gradient off, and now I think you can probably see this line's a little shallower, that's a little flatter, and that's getting to be pretty flat. So it really does look like, at least for this one embryo, the um, the, the um, cells in the embryo are beginning to come back into synchrony with each other. And if you look at a bunch of embryos, this is now the slope of one of those lines. Put the gradient on, you get desynchronization, substantial desynchronization. So the, 
the, the slow side of the embryo is 80 or 90 minutes behind the fast side of the embryo. Turn the gradient off and you decay back toward good synchrony. So that's it. Um, what I've shown you is that the embryonic cell cycle is driven by an autonomous oscillator. It's a really simple one. If you want to study an oscillator, this is a good oscillator to study. Um, the oscillator includes negative feedback loop, which we think all oscillators have to include, but it also includes this conserved interlinked positive feedback and double negative feedback system, which functions as a bistable trigger. When you've got a bistable trigger, in principle, you can get activity states propagating faster than diffusion. And in fact, that does happen in the cytoplasm from frog eggs, which we think helps coordinate the process of mitosis in this huge one cell embryo. And then once you've got multiple cells, you've got coupled cell cycle oscillators. And coupled oscillators can do all sorts of really crazy things, most of which I would think you would not want to have happen in a developing embryo. So it's going to be of interest to us to see how it is that this coupling is done in a successful way that helps keep the embryo in sync and doesn't do crazy things. Um, I'll end there, show you the, this is the graduate student who did the trigger wave stuff. That's the graduate student who's doing the embryo synchronization stuff. Joe Pomerenning was the postdoc who discovered that CDK1 activation is, is bistable. And here are the other folks in the lab, and I thank them for their work, and I thank you for your attention. Yeah. Uh, what, what's your hypothesis for the mechanism of coupling between cells with these chemicals or um, The question is, what's, what's our hypothesis for how these these cell cycle oscillators are coupled when you've got multiple cells in an embryo. Um, I think the first likely mechanism is that after cells divide in a frog embryo, they, they retain some cytoplasmic bridges for a while. And so the simplest form of coupling, I think, is that you've got two different um, or, or sites of origination of the cell cycle, the two centrosomes for the daughter cell, but you've got some sharing of the cytoplasm. And um, I think that probably happens, and that's something that we can model experimentally in, in one of our tube systems, where we could put two different extracts in a tube system that are out of phase with each other and see how they fight to, to, to get coordinated at the, at the interface. But we don't think that that's the whole story, because those cytoplasmic bridges don't persist for that long during embryogenesis, and this desynchronization phenomenon does seem to persist for a long time. So the next kind of, of coupling between cells, gap junctions persist between the cells for a long period of time. And it's possible that those are letting some small molecule, calcium or something, through to help keep the cell cycles in phase. It's also possible that it's something like mechanical coupling. You can see every time there's a cell division, the embryo beats like a beating heart. And we think of CDK1 as driving these cytoskeletal reorganizations, but it's perfectly possible that the cytoskeletal reorganizations feed back to influence the CDK1 oscillator. So um, there are ways of testing all those ideas. Not really. Um, there's. Yeah. Not really. So um, if, you, if you take a frog extract and put BAPTA into the extract, you will halt the cell cycle. So that's, that, that's something that everybody sees. When people look to see if there are spikes in calcium in a, in a frog embryo or a frog extract during the cell cycle, the results are more equivocal. Um, and the current thought is maybe there are some small local pulses in calcium that never consolidate into big time waves. But all you'd need would be one sort of little pulse of calcium that could occur at the interface between two cells, and that might be enough to, to um, communicate then back and forth between those two cells. So I, I think that's a, that's, that's a good, good possibility.
So the question is, um, where are these proteins localized and what is really driving these cell cycles? What's the limiting factor that makes an extract or a frog embryo go into mitosis when it does? Um, the, we, most of this is based on work in other cells. It seems like almost every player in that circuit is, is not uniformly distributed through cells. <laughs> V1 is exclusively nuclear, MIT1 is exclusively cytoplasmic. Cyclin B1 begins to accumulate at the centrosome at the time when the centrosome grows right before mitosis begins. So there's a lot of spatial inhomogeneity. And I wouldn't be surprised if we had a, a continuous readout of CDK1 activation in one of these extracts. I, I wouldn't be surprised if what we would see would be a, a big burst of CDK1 activation near the centrosomes that are around all of these nuclei. And then you'd have a diffusive spread of CDK1 activation until you got to the next nucleus. And then you got another huge burst and then a diffusive spread and another huge burst. So, so it's, th there are all sorts of possibilities that, 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 that could come out of the concentration of, of um, of mitotic drivers into, in particular regions of the cell. Um, and the question of what's, what's really driving this um, in an extract or an embryo, and it is cyclin synthesis. Um, so if you make cyclin synthesis happen twice as fast, um, you'll get mitosis happening twice as fast. If you make it happen three times as fast, you lock in a mitotic state. If you make it happen half as fast, you get the cell cycle going half as fast. So, so, so we think that it is actually cyclin synthesis that's, that's, um, that's driving the embryonic cell cycle. It's not true in the somatic cell cycle. You can overexpress cyclin B in the somatic cell cycle, and, you, and mitosis doesn't happen any earlier. And we really don't know what makes mitosis happen when it happens in the somatic cell cycle. It's just one of these questions that nobody's bothered to, 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 to answer yet in cell cycle biology. Oh, back there. Um, yes, this system is, act the, the clocks in this system seem to be pretty precise. And so the experimental evidence in favor of that, and the reason that nobody bothered to do that temperature gradient experiment we did is because um, um, in the 1980s, John Newport and Mark Kirshner figured out a way to take a frog embryo, a multicellular frog embryo, and dissect away the vitellin membrane, and then um, disaggregate the individual blastomeres from that embryo. And what they found was they continued to divide pretty precisely. Um, if you read the paper, it looks like those were actually individual blastomeres not making physical contact with each other. I've, John's dead now. Um, I've talked with people, though, who were around in the, in the lab, and they say that, the, that, no, they don't think that that's actually what he meant to say, that he, he was actually doing it in dishes where all of those blastomeres were making contact with at least one other blastomere, and that contact could have included gap junction communication or cytoplasmic bridge communication. So, that suggests that they're not precise, that they need that communication in order to synchronize. Right. So if... if, if Well, the interpretation of their experiment was that they had made isolated blastomeres and they continued to divide in good, good precision. But, but, but we're going back and repeating it where we actually have the two blastomeres not making, that we know absolutely for certain are not making good physical contact. And my bet is that they'll continue to divide more or less in step, but not nearly as precisely as they would if they, if, if they were um, in contact with each other. Yeah. But, right, and they'll, they'll, they'll wander away from each other. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, is it possible to have multiple origins for these waves? 
And the answer is yes, and I'll show you. I'll show you from one of these. Here, early on, I can't tell you how many origins there are here because it could be that there are a lot of really short waves. But here, you can see there is an origin, there is an origin. Probably either there are two origins or there's one big origin there and one kind of wonky cell in between. There is an origin. Um, what makes those be origins? Uh, and um, we would guess that there's just something about the nuclei or the centrosomes in this region that makes them go into mitosis too early. Maybe um, they're well-organized big centrosomes that are able to concentrate the mitotic initiators um, to high concentration and high amount. Um, so we don't really know, but, that, but, but it is the observation that we, we often have multiple origins. And as the experiment goes on, things tend to consolidate. Um, some origins win out over others. So by the end of this experiment, you know, there's only one origin on this side of the tube and um, I guess two origins on, on that side of the tube. And that's a common thing that you see both in models of trigger waves and in actual observations of trigger waves in other systems. If you start them out mal-coordinated, they tend to spontaneously organize into nice regular wave fronts. Yeah? Now, I understand you at least need, you need a negative feedback and a positive feedback. Uh, is there anything special about the characters in the wave that uh, is influenced by the double negative third Okay, the question is, um, to get an oscillator, you need negative feedback. To get bistability, you need positive feedback. How come you've got always these mirror image positive feedback and double negative feedback um, um, setups? Um, it turns out it's pretty cool, actually. If you, um, with, a, with, with a single positive feedback loop, it's perfectly possible to get a bistable response. Um, but the bistable responses tend to require a fairly precise tuning of the balance between the activation reactions and the inactivation reactions within the positive feedback loop. Um, if you have this mirror image topology, it turns out that you can get First of all, the bistable switching tends to be more all or none in character than it does with one loop. And second of all, it turns out to be much, much, much less sensitive to exactly what kinetic parameters you're assuming in each of the feedback loops. It's a really nice topology for building a bistable switch. And if you look, bistability shows up over and over again in cell cycle regulation and in cell fade induction and other kind of decisive processes in biology. And in the ones where we know details, we do often see this mirror image, positive feedback, double negative feedback. So my answer would be you need this for an oscillator, you need one of these for bistability, and if you've got two of these operating on the same time scale, operating with the same thresholds, but in mirror image topologies, um, it makes it really easy to get a, a a uh, bistable switch that's all or none in character and robust with respect to changes in the parameters of the individual components of the loops. Wow. Could, I mean, do you have kind of a mathematical statement for that? That would be something really interesting to... Yeah, I'll show you. I'll show you the... Um, the that's, uh, um, uh, have a, have a look at this, at this paper. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a nice graphical illustration of why it's, um, it, it's yeah, it, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can make the argument with one-dimensional systems, rate balance plots. It's very intuitive. And uh, take a look at this. It's a really short paper, but, but, but I think you'll like it.